So good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. We'll just uh, welcome you back to God's prophetic surprises. This is the team that's uh, been here most of the time. Once in a while, we have to substitute Dr. Tonstadt here at Loma Linda, Sarah May, our youth pastor at Garden Grove, and Dr. Pauline here at Loma Linda, Dean of the School of Religion. Do I look like a homeless person in you a do. suit? Yeah, look at this one. Look at this scruff. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what sponsored this? Well, I'm willing to tell, but I think uh, our viewers need to ask. Need to so ask? I, this is a chance to give the email address and say, if you've got questions about the book of Revelation, questions about these seven churches, or, really, or you want to know about what's wrong with my face, <laughs> uh, just ask us and we'll, we'll answer right on the show. How's You're that? You're curious. Anyway. <laughs> that was our segue to say we'd like to have you uh, write us. We're getting a few uh, notes here and there, which we love, or questions you wish we would answer. Already at passages we've studied or passages to come. Anyway, uh, gps at llbn.tv. Mm -hmm. gps at llbn.tv, and they pass it on to us, and then we can bring them to the show. Anyway, we're in the uh, book of Revelation. We're in chapter 3. We're in the seventh church of Laodicea. It's our second show on it, so this brings it to an end, and then we'll go on to the throne room vision. But in our in-between time, is almost interesting or more than our on-taping time. And Sarah, they, they thought you should uh, say some more on air about the whole issue of hot and cold and how your generation is, is connecting to God and church and stuff. So go there somewhere. Somewhere, somewhere. Well, it's kind of awkward, but you know, why not, right? Mm -hmm. So I am in my 30s and single, and so I work a lot and I have no life, and I have pointless competitions with my friends all the time. And in one of these competitions, I lost miserably, and so I had to join a dating app. Um, and it, it's really fascinating, these, like, the technology that we have out there and what people consider dating nowadays, because I just am really bad at dating, and so I just don't do you it. You want to put the email address? Up no, on I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> it's, it's good. <laughs> so anyways, my point is, what I was saying... But you saying, can write GPS oh, and <laughs> <laughs> no, so bad. Um, so the point of this, and why we were talking about it, was that I was saying it's, it's become so weird in this culture um, that we don't actually need to invest in things. We have a passive aggressive culture or an intense culture. So for example, um, either we're waiting for someone else to make a move and we're hoping that they make the move and we just kind of play along with it until we don't want it anymore, or they're really intense and we're like, whoa, back off, you just became too intense. On top of all of that, we have these apps that you just download and then you get to judge people off of their face in like two sentences and decide if you like them or not. And then if you like them and they like you, then you can carry on a conversation and decide if you ever want to meet. And it's, it's like the shallowest version of life ever. And so you spend all of this time judging people incredibly superficially off of really no information and actually not even sure if they're a real human being half the time. But, but you were talking about how young people feel with the church, that they come right. on too aggressive or you wish they would, you know. Right. God so, is hidden, we don't see the first move, talk about that. Right, so like this is, I think the problem is is that this is what we sense with church as well, is, is either we see this passive aggressive church that doesn't want to ruffle feathers and we're waiting for God to show up in it and we're like, okay, well God's not real because he hasn't showed up in our life at any point and so where is he? He's obviously not happening anymore. He's only back in the day. Or we have those churches or those groups of people that are so intense and like so opinionated and crazy that we're like, whoa, like we are so not on board with that and you are acting like lunatics and we want nothing to do with you. And so then we go the other extreme and so I think in some senses, we're polarizing people and it's creating a weird indifference because we can get our community and our, our connections with people in so many other spaces because we have these lovely devices called cellular phones that we can take with us and listen to a podcast or watch a YouTube of a service somewhere else or simply swipe left or right to find someone that we want to be madly in love with for a little bit or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> and, it, and it creates this indifference to human interaction and so what would you say there's a thousand church leaders watching right now a thousand church leaders and you would say <laughs> what you ought to do is well, I my just, generation 
Well, and I don't have all the answers. And I think this is the problem, though, is, is I think that we're getting so fixated on tradition, which I think is a beautiful thing, but we're also losing opportunity because that's not where most of the young people are anymore. I mean, I think, I know for me, I was telling you guys also that I was realizing I was becoming more negative because I was spending more time with my phone and TV and all this technological stuff, and I was missing out on the tactile nature and spending time, like, I was missing out on touching books and moving things in circles and walking and like doing basic human things that you're supposed to do and carrying on actual dialogue as opposed to texting someone. You know, I was missing out on those and I was falling into like a weird reclusive state which is very unlike me. And I think our churches aren't realizing that we're not connecting with people because we're not meeting them on any kind of level. And not that we need to go to a technical level, but I think we need to be able to draw people out of their technical level and give them something to care about. And we're not doing that because we're not doing anything relevant. We're still saying the same thing we've said for 2,800 years, 20 to 100 years, not 2,800 years. How, how, do you, <laughs> how do you get relevant without becoming as shallow as the medium? Well, and that's, I think, the constant struggle. And that's where I'm struggling as well because, you know, again, it's so hard to have real relationships with people nowadays. My friends and family are scattered across the world. And so to have a real relationship with my own family at times is super difficult. You know, I find myself having two second FaceTime conversations with my nieces. And then when I see them, they're totally different and they don't remember aspects of things. And so like, I think it's hard to find those connecting points and we need to give people we need to have a spark that makes us able to connect with them via this shallow basis, whatever it might be, something that intrigues us enough to swipe right and be like, ooh, we're a match, you know? Mm -hmm. And then there needs to be something that spurs on the conversation enough to want us to come into physical contact with it. But if we don't create a physical contact, like, and draw people out of that zone, we're gonna miss out on all of the fun things because... Does God have any equivalent to sort of swipe right and you're in? <laughs> That's uh, horrifying. <laughs> I think he swiped right on everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean that God's doing that. I'm just, I say, is there some way that that, that God can be offered to people, you know, in, in a way that, that connects with the world in which they're in. Well, and I think that's the thing is, is that I think we're so scared of being proven wrong, which is where I've always struggled. Mm. Um, I think mm. especially within our church, we're scared of being proven wrong. And so we, we go hard, like we're like, this is where we stand. This is what we do. This is and like, we almost push the answer before the question has been asked. And I think, if we have nothing to be scared of and if we have a beautiful message and a loving God, we should be okay with people bumbling through it and having trouble with it and hating it and denying it and, you know, still showing up to our community. And I think that's where we break down is, is our churches, once people say like, no, I don't believe that, like why do they have to agree with us and then are they still allowed in our community if they don't? You know, and I think that if we were truly a healthy community, people would still want to come, even if they disagreed with our. I, th I think one of the one of the things I notice in my own young adults, I've got uh, three kids and two spouses that are all in a 20, 30 something range. Uh, I think one of the critical things is authenticity. When when you're spending all of your time time with the phone, that can be a substitute for being real, mm -hmm. and and the perception is the church isn't real. The church is a bunch of people putting on an image, but when you actually get behind the closed doors, they're nasty people. You know? Well, absolutely. People, this is so awful that I'm sharing this on air, <laughs> but I'll get a text message and I'll be like falling apart emotionally. Like I'll have had the worst day ever and someone will text me like, hey, how are you? And I'm like, great, exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> like, I hate everything, you know? But like, this is the first hear about that. I know, I know. But it's an out, it's a way out of having to actually face life and people and real issues and make actual decisions. And it's it's that out. That's what we've become and I think that's what's so scary is is that it's going to continue to get worse and if we don't figure out how to help this become a healthy experience for people and a way to connect with church and God and community I think we're going to be in a very dangerous spot in a few years when our cars are driving us places and we no longer actually ever have to see another human being 
you know, I think mm. it's going to be a very dangerous. It's, it's, it's really something, you know, I, could, I get home about the time my son seems to be at the video game. I have a 23-year-old. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean he's doing it all day, right. but at the end of the day, when I get home at 11.30, that's what he's doing almost every night. And last night, the other son was here for a few minutes, and, and we had time. And we talked, and we talked depth, and it was good, because he wasn't mm -hmm. deep into the technology and the machines. Mm -hmm. And it was real, and it was, it was you, 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 you crave it. And say, well, we cheat ourselves when we don't have that. That's but true. for how for the church to step into that, mm -hmm. no one wishes to be irrelevant. No one says, let's just be old fashioned. We are what we are. We can't always keep up with all the bells and whistles of video games and technology and the best music. So it's a challenge. But I think we have to retrain ourselves because, I mean, you guys travel internationally and sometimes you don't get your fancy phone to be linked international, right? So then you go a week without your phone constantly buzzing and re ringing and all that stuff. And so when you come back to the U.S., you just leave your phone in the car and you forget. <laughs> like, I know for me, I'll leave it everywhere because I just forgot it existed. Do you remember the nights in Mexico? Yeah. You know, their cell phone did not work. You're and all hanging four out. four hours from 6 to 10 or 11, we sat around a campfire and talk. It was fantastic. Because there's nothing else to do. And the group wants to go back, <laughs> not because they love the building only, but because of the camaraderie of yes. a group being human with each other. Exactly. It was fantastic. A couple, exactly. of, a couple of my friends developed a, a, a concept of what they call stages of friendship. And I, I can do this just very, very briefly, but I think it kind of raises the point here. Stage one is greeting. You know, mm -hmm. hi, how are you? How's the weather? You know. Uh, stage two is the exchange of facts and reports, mm -hmm. uh, where you just talk about stuff that's of interest to you. You'll notice with each of the stages, you get more vulnerable. If somebody rejects your greeting, it's kind of like, what's his problem? But if they reject your fact, it might hurt a little bit. Mm -hmm. Stage three is opinions and judgments. We say, well, I think so-and-so is, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or I think that's a terrible thing to do. When somebody rejects that, you're much more vulnerable. So you see, each of these stages, as you get closer, you become more vulnerable. So stage three is where you exchange opinions and judgments. Stage four is where you trust people enough to share how you feel. Stage five is where you trust people enough to admit that you've been wrong. Stage six is where you give others the right to confront you about your faults. And stage seven is a place that rarely happens on this earth where there's no secrets whatsoever. I fear that my generation rarely gets past the opinions and judgments, stage mm -hmm. three. It sounds like maybe your generation is hardly getting past the facts and reports. Well, and that's why I think they're seeking authenticity so much because we're a generation that tweets and mm -hmm. texts. And so we share this much of ourselves. Yeah. Here's two sentences of who I am. I suppose there's opinions and judgments there. You idiot! Right. But it's scary because, like, if I tell you, like, if you say, hey, so what are you into? You know, like, I'm texting some guy. I don't never met him before. And I'm like, I like surfing. And he's like, me too. Let's go surf. I'm like, oh, man. What if he's a great surfer? Like, oh, man. Now I don't want to go. Suddenly that puts a wedge as opposed to normally maybe a normal human being would meet someone on the beach and you'd both be surfing and you kind of know that you enjoy so you know what I mean like mm -hmm. I think we're losing out on the ability to have an open conversation and like get beyond certain stages which is why I think we're seeking community and authenticity because it's such a void because we're surrounded by 2,000 friends on Facebook and 3,000 followers on Instagram and all this constant stimulation and I'm constantly putting out there that I'm doing all these fun things but really I'm sitting at home depressed and hating my life and miserable because I have nothing going on and no community and God hasn't shown up and the church hasn't done anything relevant for years and I can't buy into anything else. Can you get to Jesus with that? Take, take that further. If, if you're on good stuff here because Jesus says, stand at the door and knock, I want to come in. He wants right. to be in that. Well, isn't that, isn't that the message of Laodicea for the very challenges that Sarah's bringing I'm, up? I'm, I'm asking for something yeah. on well, that. Yeah. Well, you guys can talk, too. I feel like I've just no, been no, on, no. like, a, a no, random, no, like, discouragement. I think what you're saying is very relevant, and I, I just wonder if, if all this texting, all this stuff, you know, uh, is it authentic? You know, is it... Is it seeking something that is real or is it seeking something that isn't real, that fundamentally is unreal, that you are in some ways we're living increasingly in a sort of virtual reality and, and we have 
settled for that, you know. I'm just wondering right. to what the sort of character of the seeking is. Now, you know, in the Laodicean, I mean, the seven churches here, the seven churches are local house churches in real places, you know, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. real. This is, these are real people, real churches, real places. And, you know, in the end of the Laodicean message, Jesus comes knocking. Mm -hmm. A real person seeking real contact, not virtual contact. He doesn't send you an SMS. Maybe that, you know, right. it's real. It's, 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 you know, incarnate. Right. And then he asks you to open the door and we will sit down and there is a, a closeness, there is a meal, there is time, there is reciprocity. You will eat with me and I will eat with you. This is, you know, Gospel of John stuff, yeah. you know. And, and I'm just, so that is on offer. Maybe our churches are not able to, you know, show it. Right. But that is what is on offer in the Bible. So maybe we are failing as a church because we don't offer it. Maybe the seekers are failing because they don't seek it. You know, mm -hmm. in the sense that we seek, you know, a substitute, and we are, you know, we could have been with each other, but mm -hmm. we are online, you know, right. we are well, sort and it's of... quantity versus quality, you know, it sounds really shallow, but I mean, like, you can have a goal, I want 2,000 people to follow me on Instagram, and then you're like, 2,000 people love me, <laughs> yeah. look at this, and you feel like a rock star, and then you realize that you had a birthday, and they all wished you a virtual happy birthday, but you have no friends to come to your home and eat dinner with you. You know, and like, that's a huge blow. And that's where I think a lot of our culture is, is that they don't have a physical community anymore because we got big. And I can talk to someone in China, but I can't have a friend. Can we use that hunger to make people hungry for Jesus? I think our church is in a dangerous spot because I think we talk a lot of hurt, even though we, or, we talk a lot of well, love. we talk a lot of love, but we dish out a lot of hurt. Like, we, we have a great message without the good actions to go with it because we're, we're constantly, our theology is kind of running into each other in some I mean, Jesus is knocking, but the people don't show that same spirit themselves. Yeah. Well, I think a bottom line here <laughs> is that in the Laodicean message, it's the church that's closed the door. Mm -hmm. Or the leaders of the church, however you want to you put that. But... but there's a great need out there, which is what Sarah is bringing out so powerfully here. There's a great need out there, and that need s seeks a place where there's an open door. And if the church is, if the problem with Leia the Sea is it's closed the door, how's Sarah's gonna, generation ever going to find it? How's our generation ever going to find it? Uh, so the Leia the Sea and message is about a closed door, and it's not God that closed the door. Right. And uh, there's, there's something better than just cell phone texts. Yeah, and I think that's the, the reality is, is that our, we have a running reputation of not being open. We've shut doors in so many people's faces saying that you're not accepted because of here's your sins. And you can't come in until your sins are figured out. And you can't be one of us, you know, it's an elitist club. And I think now we're kind of getting more of a clearer theology that there's a great character of God, especially within our church, saying that God is an all-encompassing God that reaches beyond those bounds. And you can't do anything that will make him shut that door. Mm -hmm. And then now we're having to backpedal, and there's still some people that are like, but, but, but now look how corrupt and like messed up our church is getting. Look at these pews, you know, look at, and, it's confusing people. And so now I think we're kind of in a, a pickle trying to figure out like who we are and what we want to be known for. Mm -hmm. So the beauty, of, the beauty of verse 20, I think, says he stands at the door and knocks. And in, in the Greek, there are different words for knocking. And the word here is the knuckle tap hmm. on the door. It's not somebody pounding and demanding to be let in. It's not somebody breaking the door down with a pile driver. It's somebody just tapping on the door and saying, I'm here, but you have the power. You can open the door or not open the door. And this is God. This is how God approaches us. He doesn't break the doors down. He invites. He opens, uh, opens up to us. And I, I have the feeling that all generations are looking for that kind of God. 
but most don't believe that he exists. But I also think we've severely messed up where we've thrown a God that's, like, I love the miraculous God that shows up in a big way, but I think we've also, it sounds bad, but we've made only the active God, the one that, like, when you're so perfect or, like, you've followed him or, like, there's a severe thing, like, this miracle will happen. It will blow your mind. And so then when that God doesn't show up, you're like, well. So instead of J.B. Phillips, your God is too small, we've done your God is too big. Well, I, I don't think that, I mean, that's painful too, but I, think, <laughs> but I think that I like the concept of rapping. I think we miss out on God because maybe we're looking for the boom always. Mm -hmm. And he's not that. And he's not always a boom. Yeah. Like he can, he can be, because he can be all things, but like, what if we're missing him in the like the I middle? have certainly lost people who said I prayed every night for something for two years and it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Forget about it. It doesn't work. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Can I point something out in verses 17 and 18? Here? Yes, please. Because I don't think we've we've spent too much time we, with that we yet. We sort of segued from what you were talking to yeah. to 20, but we can go back to 17. Yeah, it says, because uh, here Jesus does a, does a diagnosis first. As you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need of nothing, not re realizing you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. A um, couple things strike me there. First of all, what Laodicea says she is and what she actually is are two different things. So the, there's the authenticity challenge. Mm -hmm. Laodicea is inauthentic. But then it mentions poor, blind, and naked, and I think that's the counterpart of verse 18. To the poor, he says, buy gold. To the naked, he says, put on white garments. And uh, to the blind, he says, uh, I salve, you know, so that you may see. So the cure in here, the God cure that comes when you open the door is a true kind of riches, is the garments of salvation, and is self-awareness. Yeah, you know, we talked in a previous program about how sometimes the church is not self-aware. It's boasting about this and that and the other thing. Self-awareness, discernment, to see clearly, and, and to see clearly not how great you are, but to see clearly the blindness, the poverty, and the nakedness that isn't obvious. Uh, clearly, there's a contrast here. Laodicea is physically rich, spiritually poor, but she thinks she's spiritually rich. Uh, Sar uh, Smyrna was poor in earthly goods, but rich spiritually. So you have that contrast. Is there. it important then to knock people down a little bit? <laughs> is the per is preaching and TV shows, whatever, is to say, you think, you don't know how you really are, uh, you're really like this. And then they'll be hungry for the gospel, or do we just preach the gospel? There's a time and a place for interventions. You know, if a person's an alcoholic or, or a rageaholic or something, and you might take five or six people to sit around and say, listen, you've got to realize you are a garden variety sinner, just the yeah. average selfish. But I think that's where personal relationships come in again. I think that's yeah. where this mass, like, conversion story is so dangerous, is, is that we don't address individuals and we lose the heart of ministry. And that's where I get scared, is, is that I think... I think there's beauty in church, and I think there's beauty in big churches, but I think the scariest part of big churches is that you miss the individual. And so I think it's the same thing. You can't do a mass, like a doctor can't stand in a room and diagnose a mass group of people well, with the Billy same. Graham stand up and say, you need Jesus. You're feeling stressed. You're this, you're this. You got a problem in your marriage. You need Jesus. But he, went, he has to have people feel need first. Is that part of this verse? Or do we skip right to verse 20 to say that Jesus is knocking? Or do we need to have the verse that says, you think, but you're really here? I think he has all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, think, I think we've had a very interesting and, and, and relevant uh, conversation. Maybe, you know, maybe there is a, a kind of a sort of cultural challenge that, that we are very, very out of step with what Jesus is doing. You know, so Jesus is coming to us, to our church, and knocking on our door, and so, so. But maybe, maybe we could tweak it a little and say that we also need to be Jesus in our communities. You know, we are, as a church, Seventh Day Adventist or otherwise, more and more doing virtual stuff. You know, people are 
hearing the sermons on TV. Mm -hmm. They are watching GPS. Maybe, you know, nice that you are here watching GPS. <laughs> but there are people, you know, around us that need community, you know, mm -hmm. that need networks, that need to have a knock on the door. You know, there is personal contact. I see, you know, I'm old enough that, you know, we have lost people. We see people dying, our friends, you know, and stuff. And there are lots of lonely people in the community. They discover that the network they assumed was there isn't there. So, you know, we need our Jesus to come to us and knock on our door. We need to be Jesus and go on doors and knock and have real contact, you know, and real, real communion. And you mentioned the word community and you mentioned the word tactile. Mm -hmm. You know, tactile, mm -hmm. you know, touching, skin <laughs> contact, mm -hmm. you know, and that, it, it seems to me that the Jesus who comes to us in the messages to the seven churches is that kind of person who is, you know, seeking that kind of contact and wishing the church to represent him in the world as, you know, that kind of... Take a minute you know. and answer the question I think both of you have referred to a little bit, you know, what is this now? You're eating with Jesus. You're now, mm -hmm. you've let Jesus in, but what is that? He uses eating. You said it's not the big God doing the miracles. You can't see him. You can't hear him. What is it that we can really offer that's real, that people would get away from their phone, get away from the technology and say, I have this with Jesus. What is it? For me, I will honestly say it's knowing what the people around you are there for. I mean, it's it's needs assessments. It's knowing your community enough to actually meet them where they're at as opposed to just throwing the template of a Bible study at them. But that's or, what a relationship with Jesus is? Well, for me, it's so much more than just a theology or a religion. Like, it's not, it's a personal thing. It's not... I can't explain it more than it's just a very okay, personal Jesus thing. Jesus says, I've called you friends. Yeah. Here he says, I'm going to eat with you. Yeah. What really is that for you? It's an experience. Is it walking on the beach? Is it reading a Bible? Is it going and doing a mission trip in Philippines? For me, honestly, my entire relationship with God, like when I talk about devotions, it could be painting a picture and listening to a podcast. It could be me outside sitting in a tree watching a bird for 20 minutes and being like, I don't know how that thing's like doing what it's doing. It could be literally anything, me, people watching at Disneyland for 30 minutes and being like, people are just weird. Like, I don't even know. But for me, that makes God very real and present and exciting because it's unusual and bigger than I can I'm, explain. I'm a people. You're a people. Am I weird? You're super strange. <laughs> <laughs> super strange. <laughs> but you have found real ways for God to be real. He says, I will be found by you. So there are ways to relate to the and unseen God. Absolutely. And honestly, there's aspects of reading the Bible that he comes, like, Scripture is alive and I get excited. But then there are days when I read the Bible and I don't care. And that's just real. Like, I don't care. And I have so to step out. So in those days, out. you have other ways. I have to go experience something but bigger. But he's still knocking and wants to connect with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. But at times like that, it's important to remember the letter to Laodicea, that Laodicea is even indifferent, and he's still knocking. Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, he's there. And, and it's not uh, going to always be big Not, not get side. down yeah. if we're not always there. Yeah. 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 As usual, we've come to the end. <laughs> and uh, there's lots more we could do in this chapter, but we're going to go on next week to Revelation 4 and 5, the throne room vision of Revelation. Send us an email. You can send Sarah an email. Oh, my word. We would love to have you write to us. God bless. <laughs>